of you, and thanks in particular to Shaheen, who kind of dealt with me in organizing this whole event and all the meetings, and to Kevin and Louise. And I um, just wanted to say that presenting to an environmental design program was kind of a challenge for me. I've done a lot of presentations on civic ecology. I've done a lot of reading, writing, research. And, um, but I've kind of avoided the design part of it because these practices to me, and I'll talk about them in a little bit, they're like community gardening, community tree planting. They're very organic, self-organized, grassroots. And I was kind of thinking, well, the design is kind of coming in with the expertise, the top down. And so I kind of avoided it. So for this presentation, I tried to think about design and how it plays a role in civic ecology practices. And that's where I'm going to start out. And then I'm going to give you the background on civic ecology and where it is. And then we'll come ba back to some design issues at the end. But before I do that, I'm going to cough because I've got something in my throat. So, come here. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. Oops. Sorry about that. So, um, can anybody identify where this site might be? Where this open space might be? Mexico. Mexico? Anybody else? India. It's actually in India. Um, and if, if you've been to India, you've seen a lot of spaces like this in cities that are sort of trash heaps, degraded spaces. And so what I want you to do is look at, I'm going to figure this thing out. You see this wall here and this curb here along the space. And there's a group that I've worked with, and they're very, um, I call them a civic ecology group because they're a grassroots community organized group. And what they do is they convert sites like the one you just saw to sites like this. And so I start with this one because it seems to me there's a big design element in this particular group's practice. For one, they painted this wall. And the reason they painted it that color is because that color is supposedly neutral amongst all the different ethnic groups in India. Um, they've also painted it that color because people uh, chew pan. Do you know what pan is? Or beetle juice, beetle nut? So, uh, some people know what it is, but if you don't know what it is, it's like a nut that people chew as a stimulant, and it creates this kind of, just to put it bluntly, like the first time I saw it, I thought somebody was drooling blood down their front. It creates this red sort of saliva. Um, so if you spit pond on this particular wall, then you can't see the stains on the wall. Um, and you can see that they've added some green elements here, a little path here. Right, so the, this group is The Ugly Indian. You can go on to their website, theuglyindian.com. It's a pretty cool website. And um, what they do is they conduct what are called spot fixes. So this is a result of a spot fix. Through social media, Facebook, they organize people that come out at a specific time. And three hours, and they haul out the trash and convert these sites to something like this. I need to stand behind here so that you can get the slide. OK. OK. So um, I'm sorry, I'm having a little bit of trouble with this thing. So here we are. So there you can see some of the pond stains, right, there. But another problem with the sites in India is that, and I'm really into bodily function here, sort of <laughs> to start off, but people actually urinate on these sites, like men urinate on these sites. So the guys that run Ugly Indian, they designed these no-smell urinals. So again, you can see, right, it's the same wall there, it's the same site, right? So they can, did, and there is a green element in here, which is the important part to me, because I'm not going to be able to use these here all the anyway. Um, so, um, so anyways, you know, another sort of, the guys that are behind the Ugly Indian, not the volunteers, well, they're all volunteers, but sort of are, um, they're sort of the new Indian tech middle class. And they have some not only technology savvy, and they, but also some design savvy. OK, so here's another example of a practice. This one is um, in New York City in Manhattan. And sort of like the site in India, there was a lot of vacant land that wasn't being taken care of in New York City and other cities in the 70s. And there was a lot of trash on these sites. And they were pretty much eyesores. So I want you to just look at that feature there, that cross. Because with the next, so you can see this vacant lot. People are trying to convert it. And again, you can see that cross right there. 
Um, so they've converted it to this community garden. And the reason that woman is on the right, that's Liz Christie, who was one of the biggest community activists in the community gardening movement in the <coughs> 70s in New York City. So they have this scarecrow here. I don't know if you would call that sort of an art. Or it's utilitarian, but some sort of a design element. The sort of actual planting looks pretty haphazard to me. But this, these community gardens in Manhattan, as they became older, they started to get a, a lot of these art elements in them. So this is like three stories high, and it's with pretty much all those objects like that little car um, or objects that were found in the neighborhood that this artist built. And then as the gardens became sort of more established and got more support from the city, they would add these nice um, metal fences with nice design elements on them. So I'm starting to see design in a lot of these different practices. And now what I'd like to do is just give you a little bit of background more on what are civic ecology practices, what are some of the diversity, and then sort of go through um, some of the elements of these practices before we get back to design. Okay. So this is um, a practice on, along a branch of the Anacostia River. It's in Washington, D.C. And what the young people are doing is they have this thing called a bandalong litter trap which is strung across this little creek, and they're collecting the floatable garbages that are floating down. Uh, so again, to me, it's sort of a very grassroots, community-organized stewardship practice. In this case, it was a citizen science or sort of a monitoring element, because they are measuring. I don't know, I'm not sure if it's by volume or by weight. Probably by volume, because the, the trash would be wet. but of the different components of that waste stream that's floating down the stream. And, and DC had a plastic bag ban, so they were looking at before and after the plastic bag ban. Um, anybody know what this practice is? Or where it is? It's in New York, yeah. It's in the Bronx. Um, but it could be anywhere in any of New York's waterways. So this one is oyster restoration practice. So they're putting little baskets of young oysters down into the water, and then they're, the oysters grow, and they come back, bring them back up, and again, there's a monitoring element. So the idea of oyster restoration is both to, uh, they hope that the oysters will filter the waterways around New York City, and also um, to form oyster reefs as a living shoreline protection against sea level rise and storms. Yeah, this is a group called Rocking the Boat. If you're interested in these kinds of community groups, you should definitely search Rocking the Boat because it started out as a wood shop for young um, uh, teens. And th these are, they, have, they do have a wood shop. It's immaculate. I've been there. And they, these are historic boats, rowboats, that used to ply the New York City harbors. And so they're restoring these boats. And they take people out on tours on them. And I'll just have a little aside here. I once, uh, it was in the evening, so it's kind of sunset, and a young woman took me out on one of these boats, a, a teenager who had worked at Rocking the Boat, and it's right next to LaGuardia Airport. So, like, for me, it's, like, really noisy, and there's kind of, you know, there's, there's sort of, you know, tires along the side, and you could just tell that for her, it was just this sort of very calming, natural experience, and I sort of could appreciate that, sort of just being with her. Okay, this is a practice, this is one that I started. It's on the Cornell campus. And this one, it, we call ourselves Friends of the Gorge. It's a student group. And we, do, we have a lot of trails on the campus because our campus is bordered by two deep gorges. Um, and so we do some trail work, some invasive species removal, and, and other work around campus. This one is invasive species removal. It's a group called the Urban Paradise Guild in Miami. And I volunteered with them once when I was giving a talk in Miami. And we're doing a Burma grass removal there. Oops. All right, so this one is obviously in the cemetery. It's, the group is called Friends of Ithaca City Cemetery. And we have one of those park-like cemeteries that goes between our downtown and our campus. 
And so we do tree pruning, we do trash pickup, and then we also do some grave cleaning and grave restoration. So this one has a big design element because you have to know, at least from my point of view, it's often the city and regional planning students who come down and help with the, grave rest the, the gravestone restoration. Okay, so these are all practices that you, we just went through. They're all examples of local environmental stewardship actions to enhance green infrastructure and community well-being in cities and other human-dominated systems. And we distinguish between the practices and the study, so civic ecology, which is the study of the individual community and environmental outcomes of these practices and their interactions with communities, governance institutions, and ecosystems. So when we did the MOOC, or the Masses Open Online course, as Louise mentioned, we ha sort of developed this schematic of the 10 principles of civic ecology. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through these principles, each one uh, quickly. And I should mention that we divided them into these different orbits. So we start with where and when, and then what are the parts. And then these last three I'm kind of combining, and they're sort of zooming out and looking at the practices from the outside and how they actually interact with larger systems. So we'll start with where and why. I'm really having a problem with this thing, sorry. So can anybody tell me where this is? I thought it was Detroit. And this picture actually went viral on the internet as being Detroit, but it's not Detroit. Any other guesses? It's actually Atlantic City, which obviously has some of the same issues as Detroit, I think. Um, the real estate casino industry kind of collapsed there, so. Um, but you can see these different properties. This one's probably been abandoned before this one was abandoned. You can sort of see how the, the vegetation's taken over the sidewalk. So we call these broken places. This is an example of a, what we call a slow burn broken place, like a place that's experienced disinvestment. Um, we would call this also a broken place, but this is a sudden broken place, sudden disaster. Can anybody identify where this is? It's close, far Rockaway, New York City. So after Hurricane Sandy, you can see the boardwalk's been pretty much destroyed, right? So um, our first principle is that civic ecology practices emerge in these kinds of either sudden or slow burn broken places. And then our second principle is about the motivation. And we talk about love for life or biophilia and love for places or topophilia as being motivations for why people would want to come and restore these places. So in this case, this is actually Detroit. But you know, again, this sort of same thing with boarded up housing, vacant lots where housing has been taken away, and people coming and doing tree planting. And this is actually the same site, Far Rockaway. And these are sand dune restoration practices. So they're trying to reestablish the natural sand dunes as protection against the wave action in the event of future storms. OK, so what I'm going to do now is go to the five parts, as you can see here. So these are the elements or components of civic ecology practices. <laughs> OK, anybody want to guess where this is from? <laughs> Wait, how do you know? <laughs> Because what? <laughs> but how could you tell it's Iran? Like just. So is the yellow specific to Iran? Oh, OK. I didn't realize that. Well, anyways, you're the first person that's, when I've given this presentation, that's known immediately as Iran. OK, so there's a group in Iran. I don't know if you guys have heard of it called Nature Cleaners. And it, have you heard of it? OK, so maybe you know more about it than I do, but so you can correct me if I'm wrong. But um, it was started by a gentleman who lived in Germany for about 30 years. So he basically lived his adult life in Germany, working. He had seen the way green spaces were kept up in Germany. And when he came back to Iran, he saw how you would see a lot of sites that were really very trashed out. 
And so he decided to start cleaning up. He posted the photos of the cl first cleanup he did with his family friends on Facebook, and it kind of went viral. And now there's nature cleaner groups in every state in Iran. And also, if you guys search nature cleaners, they also have a actually English language online presence. There's a video that's been done about them in English. It's a, it's a news video. And you can probably find some other things in case you don't speak Farsi, which I don't, maybe. Um, so, but this practice is actually not that unique in that it, there's a huge social component, right? So it's not just cleaning up the trash. It's also people come together afterwards for tea or for soup. And so the, an element of these practices is sort of this creating a sense of community. Do any of our Iranian or Iranian American <laughs> um, participants want to add anything? So that's the other indication that it's Iran. Okay. Are they good? You miss them? Okay. So a sense of community is one. Um, social ecological memories. Anybody want to hazard a guess where this one is? It's in the U.S. I'll tell you that. Or where the woman might be from. So this is a community garden in Sacramento. It's a Hmong garden, like H-M-O-N-G. Did you say that and you didn't say it loud enough? <laughs> okay, next time, we'll give you a second chance. Um, and you can see she's growing foot-long beans, right? So you, know, you can read about stories about these refugees coming to the United States and how they would sow seeds into the hems of their jackets, whatever, when they came over, because it was so important for them to bring something and to be able to cultivate something from um, where they grew up or where they were from. All right, Danielle, you're from Pennsylvania. This one's from Pennsylvania. <laughs> it's actually from Philadelphia. Okay. And it's another community garden. Um, I like this photo because you can see that th this is the mural here, right? So here's the community garden. It's mostly an African American garden. Um, but people have recreated this sort of pastoral scene, again, thinking about agricultural roots and where they came from. Okay, this is a garden in New York City, but can anybody sort of identify where the gardeners might be from? Puerto Rico, all right. And actually, nobody's ever guessed that right either in any presentation I've given. So why Puerto Rico, Luis? The casita. The casita, right? So I don't know if you guys, I guess this would be a design element, right? It's kind of an um, uh, illegal design element, actually. The city's been trying to take these down because of the fire hazard, et cetera. But so, um, you'll see a lot of the gardens with the, the casitas, the little houses that people, when they work in the fields, they would come and rest in maybe after, after lunch. Um, so. The idea is these memories, right? You're bringing these sort of social and biological memories, the seeds, the cultural practices from where you're from into these practices. Uh, and I, I really like the social ecological memories one, so I spent a uh, number of slides on it. But um, anybody know where this is? OK. So this is New York City selling oyster. Has anybody read Mark Kalansky's book, uh, History on the Half Shell, um, um, The Big Oyster? So um, it's the history of New York City and the role that oysters, how important oysters were, both for their abundance, people eating them, but also sort of them defining New York City as a place. And I mentioned the oyster restoration efforts a little bit earlier, but here's an example of a oyster gardener, another oyster gardener volunteer. And we did a little bit of research on these volunteers, the oyster gardeners, and he talks about how we used to have the largest oyster uh, population of oysters, and we no longer have that. To me, that's almost like cutting out the liver from the human. And so the whole idea of oysters are filtering, right? They're filtering the pollutants. That's why they're like the liver. And if we can rejuvenate the oyster population and bring back some life to the East River, then I think that says a lot for our own population. So again, this idea of sort of biological and cultural practices from the past. 
Okay, so the next one is well-being. Are you guys getting tired of me asking you to identify places or is this keeping you engaged at this hour? Okay, who can tell me? Anybody who's further in the back can tell me what this one is, where this is, and why? The Brooklyn Bridge, great, very good. So this is Friends of Brooklyn Bridge Park and I like this a lot because of the older gentleman and the younger child there. So this is a group that they're doing helping the park with some landscaping. But uh, as Louise Chawla can tell you, there's been a ton of research on sort of the importance of connectedness to nature in terms of our health and well-being. And um, there's also some really interesting work out of Australia of people who are involved in these land care and bush care and these sort of similar groups where they're doing some restoration or stewardship work on the land. And they talk about, um, there's a lot of seniors involved in those particular practices. And they talk about leaving a legacy for, not only for the environment, but for the, for the next generation. So I think that's sort of part of sort of well-being also. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you this one because it's kind of hard to identify. There's no identifying features, but this is, um, in the Bronx, and this is actually also the same group rocking the boat in terms of the high school interns that are involved in creating this BIOS well garden. Um, so this is about ecosystem services, right? Sort of the, and here's the, the sort of final garden design, but about capturing the water that's running off from a parking lot, which would be to the right and then the water running through this biofoil garden and then into the Bronx River. And there's an, uh, speaking of design again, there's an artist, Lillian Ball, who's very involved in this project. And I'm not sure what she's doing, because to me this looks like landscape, landscape design, right? Not art, but anyway, it's, uh, um, she has, so she has a, there's a lot of presence on uh, Lillian Ball and her engagement in these different um, bioswale gardens in the city and how she's sort of as an artist kind of found an environmental awakening and that was how she was expressing it. Okay, learning. So uh, we think environmental learning, as Louise referred to, is a very important part of these practices and that the learning is right embedded there as you're engaged in the practice, right? And so not necessarily sort of telling people what to do beforehand, they can go and learn on site from other people. This group, uh, anybody know where this group is from? Or which group this is? You guys should all know. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, if you can read the, the attribute. So this group is uh, Wildlife Restoration Volunteers, is that WRV? And they're here in Boulder. And this is after the floods that you had a few years ago, and they're doing some trail restoration work. And we actually did a little research on them and several other youth groups that were involved in these practices, and we used these ideas of, of cognitive maps. So what they would do, we'd ask, ask them to map what they were doing, basically their practice beforehand, and then afterwards. And then we would sort of look at the complexity of these mental maps before and after as an indication of what they learned. Okay, oops, sorry about that. So we've done the elements. That means we've gotten this orbit. And now we're gonna go to the last two and I'm gonna combine them because one of the things we did when we did the MOOC and also there's a book um, that my colleague Keith Kisbal and I wrote on civic ecology is we had these 10 principles but they were kind of like hypotheses. And so we're revising them as we go along and, and probably the most revision is here on these last three. So that's why I'm kind of combining them. And, and this is all, as I mentioned um, earlier, about sort of how these practices scale up, how they can have larger impacts, or how they're interacting with the larger system of, of which they're a part. So um, this is Chicago Wilderness, obviously, and that's an alliance of about over 350 organizations, nonprofit, business, and civil society. And they're all concerned, as you can see, with protecting nature and enriching life in the Chicago region. They do a, um, a lot of 
sort of savanna or prairie restoration, a lot of invasive species removal. I actually went out on a volunteer activity with them, and you talk about the social. So we had to cut down all this brush, and then we put it in a pile, and then they make a big fire, and then they cook hot dogs on it. So not quite the biscuits, but maybe the same idea. All right, so if we think about these practices, these individual restoration practices, they're really small, right? So they're you know little tiny community gardens or one little forest preserve where you're doing some kind of invasive uh, species removal. And I'm really interested in how they can have some greater importance, how they can scale up. So the kinds of groups that I'm looking at, and I know somebody in the back probably can't see, but down here at the bottom is the Friends of the Forest Preserves, right? So they're these small groups that are doing as I said, invasive species removal, maybe litter cleanups, et cetera. But the larger organizations, more powerful organizations, are also involved. So the Field Museum is a major museum in Chicago, and they also take groups of volunteers out. Actually, I, when I went out, I was th it was through the Field Museum. And they'll collaborate with these smaller groups in terms of these restoration projects. And then you can think of the city of Chicago, the Chicago Wilderness, which is this regional network the state level, and then these national organizations like Land Trust Alliance and the Metropolitan Green Spaces Alliance, which is basically an alliance of urban land trusts. Um, and so the whole idea is that through this sort of collaborative and working at different scales, that these small practices could have a larger impact. And another way to look at this is through a social network map. So basically, this is the work from the US Forest Service Urban Field Station in New York City. And what Erica Svensson and her colleagues there have done is they've cataloged all the environmental stewardship organizations in New York City that they could find. And they had over 2,000. And then they did this social network map, which basically shows who's communicating with who, who's getting resources from whom. But the important thing for our purposes is that the red are the civic groups. So as part of this network, there's a whole lot of civic groups, and a number of these civic groups are going to be the community gardens and the friends of parks and the small groups with whom I'm working. And so that's another way sort of that being part of these, gov we might call them governance partnerships or network governance, that they can play a larger role. OK, so I want to go back to the Bronx. And when you think about Detroit and all the media it gets today, with all the spaces that have been disinvested and houses abandoned and burned and torn down. Um, you, those of you who are a little older would remember the Bronx is burning and sort of what was going on in the Bronx in the 1970s. And at one point in some neighborhoods, over 90% of the housing was burned or abandoned. So it's kind of, I mean, it kind of puts Detroit in perspective when you can see what the Bronx looked like. Um, 40 or 50 years ago. So the Bronx River was also very much uh, disinvested. You can see some dumping along the Bronx River. It's been written about how you could jump from one washing, dump washing machine to another and cross the river that way just by skipping across the washing machines. And similar to what we've seen with the vacant lots and the, the sort of degraded small pieces of land in cities in India, there were groups that decided they wanted to restore the Bronx River. And this is a recent shot. I don't claim that the Bronx River looks that blue, but this is a photograph. I didn't take it. Um, but it is true that there's been a lot of restoration um, and that there now is recreation. Here's one of those rowboats, but they also have canoe regattas down the Bronx River. And um, you know that bioswale garden I talked about with the artist? Um, that's right here. This is an old concrete plant, and it's now Concrete Plant Park. So there's been a whole lot of sort of green infrastructure restoration along the Bronx River Corridor. And I had a student, Alex Kudryavstev, who studied six of the organizations involved, but there's actually about 60 organizations involved up and down this small river, right, in, in um, New York City and Westchester County. And one of the organizations, so the Bronx River Alliance, which I think is one of the more high capacity of these organizations, they're sort of the 
sort of center of this network. So if we did a network map, they would be at the center. And um, the city has done something that I think is really important in that instead of sort of, I mean, the city's municipal governments are recognizing, right, that these are important practices, that they can leverage them. This is essentially free labor of people who are restoring some spaces and creating actually, you know, value in their communities, economic and social and environmental. So, um, but instead of New York City sort of taking over and saying, hey, now we're going to do this, they have worked with this Bronx River Alliance, one of these organizations here, as the front organization, which to me, I think is really important because so much of this is sort of the grassroots spirits of self-organizing. And I think a lot, you've probably seen sometimes when cities come in and say, hey, we're gonna have a community gardening program, it doesn't really work. It's, it sort of works a lot of times better from the ground up. And it wasn't only the city government that's been involved in supporting the Bronx River restoration. So this is Congressman Jose Serrano. He's in the House of Representatives. I think he's been there about 30 years and he's been involved in a lot of these restoration efforts from the start. So he talks about how we started just picking up trash, but we created a movement. And I think by movement, he means that this whole corridor, now there's so much of this kind of um, civic environmental activity going on. And he also was responsible for a lot of funding coming from earmarks from the federal government, when we used to have earmarks, to support these restoration practices. Okay, so um, I'm sort of edging back to design. But I wanted to talk about sort of both policy and design with this slide. So this is the ugly Indian again. And they're the group, remember I had at the beginning, that cleans up those um, trashed out spaces um, with the spot fixes. And um, so when they would do these spot fixes, one of the things that they would try to do is hold them next to a municipal building because they felt like the municipality wasn't taking responsibility for managing the open space. So if they could embarrass the municipality, maybe the municipality would then get involved. And they would also hold these spot fixes next to um, the homes of Bollywood stars and the homes of rugby players. So they're really trying to get the more powerful people and get them involved. And in terms of municipality, at least, um, the municipality, again, sort of saw that this was an opportunity for them. So now they enlist, enlist the Ugly Indian and their volunteers to do things like paint these flyovers, which are essentially the um, supports for the freeways, right? Um, so obviously there's some kind, I, I assume that you include art within design, so that's why I have this sort of, there's this design element coming in, but there's also um, this real attempt to interface with the uh, municipal policymakers and municipal government. Okay, oops. So what I wanted to do was close by talking about two different approaches to design and community engagement. And I'm gonna come back to the community gardening movement in New York City again. So um, if you remember that slide of the community garden with Liz Christie in New York City and I talked about how they were abandoned spaces and then community leaders like Liz Christie kind of came came and, and sort of took over these vacant properties, right? So they were squatting on the properties and it was somewhat of a green gorilla type movement. They were throwing seed bombs over fences when they couldn't get into the spaces, basically balls with dirt and seeds, so they sprout and, um, and sort of trying to take over and clean up these spaces. But, and at the time that was fine, right? Because the government didn't care because everybody was leaving the city, so there was tons of vacant space. So they were pretty much ignored even though they didn't have title to the property. But in the late 1990s, when New York City was experiencing an economic boom, um, the properties became valuable for development. So some of you remember, may remember this because it got quite a bit of publicity. That Mayor Giuliani at the time um, decided that he wanted to take over about 120 of these gardens and develop them into commercial properties or into housing. And the gardeners had been engaged with these you know, for 20, 30 years at that point, And they were not very happy about them being developed. So there were a lot of protests. And there were two different organizations that stepped in to try to help uh, sort of mediate and solve this issue of development and, and preserving the community gardens. So I'm gonna start out with a quote that just is from a gardener at that time. And the quotes I have are, I should attribute them to um, a paper by Efron Eisenberg, 
about the community gardening sort of situation and history in the late 1990s. So this gardener said that the seeds of community green space is the heart of the hardworking people who were there originally when the place was bulldozed, burned down, everyone left, and it was the people themselves saying, we need to make it a better place for our community and build ourselves, for ourselves, by ourselves. No government, nobody was helping at all. Right? So these people sort of feel like, like, you know, we did this, we organized this. And so now it's being taken away, and then two organizations came in, as I mentioned. So the first organization was Trust for Public Land. And Trust for Public Land, they said, okay, we want to preserve these gardens and not develop them. And so our model is that we're going to purchase the land, and then we're going to form land, community land trusts or urban land trusts, and then eventually the, prop, the title of the land will go over to these land trusts. And they were successful. They, there's three land trusts. There's um, the Bronx Land Trust, the Manhattan Land Trust, and the um, Brooklyn Queens Land Trust. Okay, so and um, this is Five Star Garden in Harlem, and it became a trust for public land garden at that time, so it didn't get destroyed. Uh, this is the garden, gardener, Classy Parker, and she grows things like lemon cucumbers. She has a peach tree in there. And um, you can see that she has a gazebo. They have concerts in there. And notice that the design, like it's a trust for public land garden, so it's owned by a major nonprofit organization, and yet, you know, it still looks kind of random, like uh, not a lot of design elements, or at least formal design elements in this garden. So um, if, you if you sort of talk or hear from Trust for Public Land and how they thought about this. I have a quote from them. And they said that the decisions about community gardens' future should be made by the garden volunteers. Community gardens grow up from the grassroots, and so we did have a philosophy was that they should continue to be grassroots run, right? So they allowed this sort of organic design to occur. But at the same time, Trust for Public Land they thought that the gardener should not only be engaged in gardening, per se, but also in the governance or the management, sort of the policies of the, of the gardening. And this did not go over well with some of the gardeners. And I have a quote here from one of the gardeners who says, I was very involved in setting up the Brooklyn version of land trust, the Brooklyn Queens land trust. People like myself got stuck in going to land trust meetings that are way too detailed. Oh my god, why are we reinventing the wheel? So, um, you know, I think their trust for public land model has been successful in many ways, but apparently, you know, it was a little much, too much maybe engagement for some people, at least in terms of the governance aspect of it. And I, I think this is interesting because um, if you go back to the Ugly Indian, their philosophy is don't ever have any meetings, don't have any planning meetings. If you have planning meetings, you'll never get people out there to do the spot fixes. So just sort of Tell them on Facebook when the spot fixes are going to occur, and they'll go out and clean up the space, and then, you know, um, we don't need to worry about the volunteer engagement. It just occurs. So Trust for Public Land is one model. The second major organization was the New York Restoration Project. Um, this was an organization that was founded at that time in the late 1990s by Bette Midler, the entertainer. So um, Bette Midler, she had some money. And she also had some connections. She was actually, and now we have the mayor, the new mayor Giuliani left. We have Bloomberg. She's very connected with Mayor Bloomberg. And um, according to Trust for Public, um, New York Restoration Project, a lot of the gardens were kind of looking like this. I don't know if I believe it, but that's what it says on their website. So they, they've been sort of neglected by the gardeners. They were no longer vibrant spaces. And it could be partly because they thought they were going to be paved over. Um, because I don't think I've seen any gardens that have been neglected in the city. I've seen them elsewhere, but not in the city. So anyways, but obviously there were some. They have this photo. And look at, sort of focus on that building there. Because in the next shot, you're going to see what New York Restoration Project did to this space. Right? So you can see the same building. It's the same garden. But they put all these very formal design elements. And this one was actually sponsored by Tiffany Company. So it's called the Tiffany Family Garden. And according to Eisenberg, who's written this history of, of how these uh, Trust for Public Land New York Restoration Project got involved, he went by this garden one day after it had been converted, and there were two African-American women sitting out front. And he said, well, you know, why aren't you going in the garden?
garden. They said, well, we're not welcome here anymore. It's not our space anymore. Um, and so we have a couple of quotes from gardeners about this particular garden. Um, it's not like an organic thing that was built over the years where people were piecing together little bits from here and there. It definitely doesn't feel like anybody's space that lives on that block. It is different than knowing that you fill all these beds with soil on the wheelbarrow. And then the last one, we feel like at any time, New York Restoration Project will change our design or want to do something different and we can't be here. The best way for those gardens to look nice is for the gardeners who garden them to be happy. And how do you do that except by listening to gardeners? So there was quite a bit of reaction to this sort of um, conversion of essentially what were community design spaces, community engaged spaces, to formal pocket parks, I think which you, which you would call them. And they're, I mean, it's a very beautiful site. So you know, you can look at some of the issues. So with that, I just wanted to say that there's you know, a lot of these practices. What we've tried to look at, at what are the commonalities amongst them and also tease out some of the differences. And that they may um, play a role, even a larger role, in sort of design of public spaces in New York City. So, um, you know, this is a, um, a firm that's envisioning oyster reefs, sort of living shorelines again in New York City in the future, as well as this living shoreline to protect the um, southern end of Manhattan with all kinds of green infrastructure, right, that, that it can be flooded. All right, so I wanted to um, thank my colleague Keith Didball up in the left, who's done a lot of this work with me, as well as the Ugly Indian and all the community um, gardeners and other volunteers, and as well as the University of Colorado Denver, uh, Boulder, excuse me. And I don't know if you know these people, but they're engaged in some, you guys are engaged in some of these activities also.